Welcome to another Amber Roots devlog. This time we'll be looking at some tweaks I made to the combat system from the previous video, as well as some new ideas I've been playing around with. So let's jump right in. When I put out the last video, I got a couple of suggestions from people about having a move distance based limit rather than a time limit on the combat turns. This is actually something I had thought about when implementing the timer system. The reason I opted for the timer was that I thought it would be quicker and easier to get working and would get the point across on the video. I do think a distance limit is a good idea to try though, and I thought maybe it would even fit the turn-based feel of the game better than a timer. So I worked on getting it put together and I'm excited to show everyone the new system. But first let's talk about how it works. Limiting movement is a bit more nuanced than the timer was, which is exactly why I opted for the timer the first time around. One thing I had to consider when putting this together was how I wanted to limit the movement. There are two main ways I thought to do it. The first was to allow complete freeform movement within some radius. So the Amberling could walk around back and forth, and as long as you stayed within your area, there were no limits. Then during the next turn, the movement area would recenter to where the Amberling was at the start of the new turn. The second option, which is what I chose to implement, is limiting the amount of movement an Amberling can do in a turn. It sort of works like a step counter, meaning if the Amberling moves forward, then back to where it started, it all counts against the pool of movement. I think this works better because it has a clear end to the movement amount, and it works better for complex level geometries like a tightly packed area like a maze. I also made a movement bar so that it can clearly indicate how much movement an Amberling has left in their turn. You can see it at the top of the screen where the timer used to be. Also, since I plan on having things you can interact with in combat that won't cost action points, this system has a natural limit to how many of those you could trigger in a single turn. The other major consideration when switching to this system from the timer was vertical movement. I ended up deciding to not count vertical movement against the movement points. So this means you can jump all you want and if you drop down from a higher area, the fall does not count against your movement points unless you're also moving horizontally. So basically your steps are counted as if combat were a flat 2D plane. I think the result of this is pretty good. You can now take your time looking at the battlefield, planning out where you want to go, but you still have a limited amount of distance you can cover. Additionally, now you have to end your turn manually, so you can move, attack, and then move some more, and only end your turn when you're ready. Personally, I'm really happy with this change, but let me know down in the comments what you think. I always appreciate the feedback. The biggest new system I added this time around was changing the way Combat AI found destinations. In the combat demo shown on the last video, the AI would simply pick a valid location within range of their attack, and move there. Mostly this worked fine, but it also meant that the AI could attack through walls or other obstacles as long as the distance between them and their target was within range of the attack. So I set out to create a line of sight system, and I had actually started this before the last video went up and showed the beginnings of it. Unfortunately, I basically had to scratch what I had made and make a new system since there were a lot of considerations that I hadn't taken into account when I made the quick implementation. I ended up iterating the system three or four times over the course of this update, but I think I finally landed on something that's working quite well. So let me show you a glimpse as to how it works. As I've mentioned before, I'm using the A-Star Pathfinding Project asset for Unity. It's an awesome asset with so many movement features and has so many different types of ways to handle pathfinding. There's a free version so you can check it out at no cost, and the free version comes with most of the major features. The way I'm using it here is I'm creating a graph for my scene, and that's where the agents look for pathfinding. When a scene loads, it scans the scene and generates a pathfinding graph. This is all standard A star stuff, and I'm doing this for every scene. So how does this all tie into line of sight? The generated graphs are made up of nodes. These nodes are regularly spaced out and all represent positions on this graph. What I'm doing is saving these nodes onto an array that I can reference. So when the AI starts their turn, they evaluate what they want to do. When they pick a target, they basically loop through all the nodes on the combat scene and check the line of sight for each one with a ray cast to their target. So let's take a look at this in practice at the enemy's turn. Here I've spawned in game objects of different colors to help visualize the line of sight for the graph. 
The brown ones are the default ones that have no line of sight and just represent nodes on the graph. All the other colors represent nodes with line of sight, but just because a node has line of sight doesn't mean I want to consider it for the agent's destination. For example, the orange nodes have line of sight, but are out of reach, so the agent can't find a path to them. Purple nodes have line of sight and are reachable by the agent, but are outside the range of the attack chosen, so those are out too. Blue nodes are the ones we're interested in. These have line of sight, are reachable, and are within the range of the agent's chosen attack. Out of all the blue nodes, the agent picks whichever one is closest to it and chooses it as its destination, making it green. There's some more details to it than just that, like making sure the raycast is fired from the right position on each node, but that's the gist of it. So far this is working really well. Now the AI does still need a lot of behavioral work, like right now they just pick random targets, so if they don't complete their goal in one turn, they might do something else next turn, but that's something I'll tackle later. For now I'm really happy with the line of sight system. I'm not using it out of combat though since having that many agents checking the nodes at once would be really messy and likely not very performant. The advantage of doing this in a turn-based combat system is that the nodes only need to get checked once per turn. So that covers the new line of sight system, but I have a few other things to talk about. A quick new thing, as you've been watching, you may have noticed, I have a new font. It's a really nice pixel art font, and I think it makes the look of the game feel a lot more cohesive. Also, in case anyone's interested, the pixel art font I'm using is free, and you can get it at itch.io. I'll have a link down in the description. I'll likely keep finding different pixel art fonts and seeing what works best for this game, but I think this is a good start. It's also a sign of things to come, since I really need to do a UI overhaul. I want to change quite a few things about the UI, but I keep putting it off. Let's see if I can show some changes in the next video. One last thing I want to talk about is something I just threw together last minute. So I'm still fairly new to shaders and shader graph, but I'd made some custom shaders for my sprites when I switched the game over to 3D. I decided to look into updating my sprite shader to be able to color swap out regions of a sprite. As the base for this shader, I used the shader made by Adam C. Unis, link down in the description. That video is really helpful, really awesome stuff. It's really great because the shader can basically replace colors in real time. I extended the shader a bit to work with various color regions. Basically it takes a sprite and divides it using masks, and then it recolors to whatever color is set, and then puts the sprite back together. So I made the player sprite using these color regions I set up, the regions being outline, eyes, and then four generic color regions. Then I just apply the shader to the player and choose the colors for each region. I also made a quick script that updates these colors from the inspector in real time, and this would be the script I need to talk to to change these colors in game so that the player can actually choose the colors in the future. This is working wonderfully, and I can't wait to see if it works with what I have planned for the future. Fingers crossed. The only bummer with using this recolor system like this is that the shading is never going to be quite as precise as picking defined colors myself for the sprite. But honestly, I think the ability to easily recolor sprites and let the player recolor them too far outweighs the cons the system has. So as always, let me know what you think and give me some feedback on all these new things I'm doing. I always really appreciate that. And if you like the video, hit the like button, subscribe to see more Amber Roots devlogs, and hit the bell for notifications. And as always, thank you for watching.